Okay, so welcome everybody to the Amherst Community Chat for Thursday, October 29th. Today we have special guest um, Amherst Police Captain Gabe Ting and Amherst COVID Ambassador Coordinator, that's such a tongue twister, Kat Newman, as well as your town manager, Paul Bachman. My name is Brianna, Communications Manager for the town. So welcome everybody who's joining us today. I'm gonna to give a chance for your town manager to give any updates he has. Thanks, Brianna. So yeah, a couple of things happening. One is we're getting ready for Halloween, which we'll talk a little bit uh, with uh, Gabe and Kat about. But also last Friday, the university announced that it was um, its plans for February and uh, announcing that it was gonna increase the number of students living on campus from about 1,200 to about 8,700. Um, and so that's given everybody a lot of time to start to think about it. And, and they have really proven themselves over the course of this semester with a very robust testing um, regimen. So uh, built some confidence in their ability to manage forward. We obviously the town has concerns, but um, we're, we are meeting, we meet with the university weekly on those types of things. Also note that the Amherst College announced today that it was uh, its plans for the spring and they're increasing their students on campus as well. So those are two quick updates. Great, thank you, Paul. And before I ask Kat and Captain uh, Gabe Tank to introduce themselves, I just wanna remind everybody who's joined live, uh, you will get a chance to ask questions. Feel free to start putting those into the Q&A button if you're joining us from Zoom. Um, you may also raise your hand in Zoom to be acknowledged live or press star nine if you're joining from a telephone. All right, so Captain Tang, do you wanna introduce yourself and say hello to the room? Hi everyone, uh, Gabe Tang. I am uh, the operational captain for the Amherst Police Department. Uh, been here for 23 years in the department and I'm a local, I grew up in Amherst. Um, so just happy to be here and appreciate the invitation. Great, thank you. And Kat? Hi everyone, I'm Kat Newman. I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm the COVID-19 Amherst Ambassador Coordinator. As Brianna said, it's quite a mouthful. Um, so I work part-time for the town um, and I'm just really, really happy to be here and get to connect with you all. So thanks for having us. Excellent. So um, I know we we're gonna talk a little bit about Halloween, Halloween safety and just some of the outreach that you've been doing generally. Um, can you guys report out on some of the recent happenings that you've, that you've been working on? And Kat, I know you have a great um, visuals to show us too. So let me know if you wanted to start and I can have some of those things queued up. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so maybe what we'll start with um, is the document where the community partners. So one of the things that I'd like to talk a little bit about with everyone is on October 24th, which was last weekend on Saturday, we were blessed with a really lovely weather, which was great. Um, we did a really large townwide effort around Halloween safety. Um, and so I just wanted to have Brianna pull this up because um, really I think that the pandemic in particular is highlighting the ways that we need to come together, um, right? To support communities and things like that. And so I think that this outreach uh, day really highlights how well functioning of a, of a team we have. Um, and really it's, you know, we need to, I think, pay homage just to the, the partnerships and the, and the really interesting and unique collaboration we have. So I just wanted to also say thank you publicly to all the folks from the town of Amherst. It was really great to have so many of the council folks there. Um, you know, as well as folks from inspection services, Mindy Dom, our state rep came out, which was great. And then we also had a whole host of folks from the UMass um, Amherst area as well. So Dean of Students, Tony Maroulis, Betsy Krakow, Sally Lenowski, and Mora. We also had Rowan and Anne who are working over at the testing center at UMass, which was really great. Um, and then we also had a bunch of our COVID ambassadors we also had our UMass Police Department. We often do outreach with them. It was really great to see them. So big shout out to Brian and Tom. And then also from our um, Amherst Police Department. Uh, we also, what was exciting about this is we had sort of our folks who are often doing community outreach with us, but also some of our newer officers. So they're getting to sort of see that aspect of community outreach and policing. Um, and then also um, the other team that I oversee at UMass, Team Positive Presence, uh, who are part of the Walk This Way crew, who belong to the Peer Health Ambassador Network, um, also helped in creating all of these materials and helping put them together. So I just wanted to take a second to sort of say thank you to all of those folks, um, as well as let our community know that it's a really big effort. And I think a lot of times, especially in COVID, that, you know, we're seeing things like 
you know, we're, we're working virtually a lot of times, right? So we don't always get to see all the behind the scenes work and just a really big thank you to these folks. They volunteered on their Saturday, many of them to do this. Um, so what I wanted to do was then talk a little bit about where we did outreach. Um, Brianna, if you could pull that up. So what we did was we designated six different areas um, and these areas are done, uh, sort of made or identified, if you will, excuse me, um, in a variety of ways. So some of it is outreach. Many of these areas are outreach that we've already done um, knock and talks throughout the semester. And then a lot of our um, outreach is also funneled through with the COVID uh, hotline. And so if there's areas of concern or things like that, we sort of do follow up visits to that. So I have a student on my uh, staff right now who's a geography major over at UMass and is really interested in map making. So he prepared individual maps for folks like while they were out in the field to see where they're going. And then I think visuals are really helpful. So we wanted to sort of share out with folks where we went and what we did. So we had six different um, groups total. Uh, we really wanted to be cognizant of social distancing, um, you know, in our own groups and sort of at large. So that's why we broke them up this way. And then we could also cover more ground. Um, so what's really exciting about this is that we went to total out of these six groups, we went to 386 different locations. So that's 386 different knocks on doors and chatting with folks. And one of the things that I think is also really important to highlight about this work is, you know, Paul, you had talked about UMass, you know, bringing folks back and really we're a community, right, that has students as well as permanent residents, right? And that's what makes Hammer such a robust, thriving, exciting community, I think. And this outreach um, wasn't targeted just to students or just to permanent residents, it was both. So we interacted with um, 119 permanent residents. So little Ittle Bittles that we talked about, their Spider-Man costumes that they were talking about to older residents. Um, and then a lot of college students, we interacted with 204 of those. Um, so that was really exciting. And then quickly, I wanted to talk about some of the materials and the messaging that we did during that outreach. So Brenna, if you want to pull up one of those flyers, um, I can share that. So this is something that our student teams over at UMass at Team Positive Presence made. So we did sort of two different, they're two-sided chops. I have the live version, um, but uh, the first page is for sort of tips and tricks. So it's a little bit um, of safety reminders and things like that. We had received guidance um, through the CDC, which is on the town website. Um, and so we sort of re-emphasize that messaging. What's important to note about this, I think, is that a lot of this messaging is already stuff that we've been doing on a weekly basis with folks. It's just sort of with a, a Halloween twist, if you will. Um, we also are providing sort of alternate things to do in place of in-person gatherings. I think we're all cognizant and aware that the weather is getting colder. So we wanna really emphasize to folks on ways to stay safe. And then the second side of that, so if you wanna scroll down, Brianna, um, was sort of a, a tips and tricks edition that we put out for our permanent residents um, or folks that we would perceive as having trick-or-treaters. So, you know, a kind of a reminder of trick-or-treaters, the messaging around that was really, you know, make sure you wear a face mask, a, a Halloween mask doesn't really count you know, social distance from the groups that are otherwise out maybe trick or treating, uh, you know, basic safety, like plan a route, have, you know, good lighting, things like that. Um, continue to remain in your pods, keeping things small makes things safe. And then uh, we also had a lot of conversations with permanent residents that might be giving treats to folks. Um, so what we asked was, um, and this is all based on the information that was put out on the town website as well. Um, and those QR codes down there link directly to the town site, as well as the mass.gov site. Um, but really like talking with residents and, you know, some people are diehard Halloween folks, um, no pun intended, I guess, with Halloween. Um, and they really wanted to, you know, still put something out or participate and wanted to do that safely. So we had a lot of conversations. Um, we spoke with, my group spoke with an Amherst professor who said, well, could I put individual things out like lining my deck sort of, so people could just take one piece of candy. And that's kind of what we talked about, you know, so sort of avoiding communal candy bowls, um, doing more of a goodie bag thing, having hand sanitizer, um, that sort of stuff. Um, and then also, if you wanna uh, pivot to the next flyer, um, these were also recommended Halloween tips and tricks activities as well that we had folks um, put up. So again, just another way to reemphasize that, you know, we know it's Halloween, we know everyone is sort of having pandemic fatigue in a way, but there are a lot of ways that you can still sort of celebrate and enjoy Halloween around and doing that safely. So we sort of talked about some of those. And that was also exciting to highlight some of the town of Amherst events that are happening. 
Um, so we highlighted those and put the QR code there. And then the second side of that flyer um, also talks a little bit more around, you know, planning your visit while you're out and what you do when you return home. Um, and then I'm going to have you actually show the last flyer as well. Um, so one of the things that I think is really interesting about this work, and it's sort of um, when I think about, you know, my work in social justice and the praxis and all of that, it's really about relationship building is at the core of that. And I think one of the things that we hear time and time again, both from our students as well as our permanent residents, is that, you know, they love Amherst and, and they want to return to a, a, you know, typical life in Amherst and things like that. And there so many people are doing the right thing. But I think that when we, you can articulate um, compassion and care and sort of saying to folks like, hey, we're here, you might not see us necessarily, but we're here and so many people are doing the right thing. I think that's important. So one of the things that we piloted this week was little, sorry, we missed you um, love notes. So just sort of reminding folks like, you know, we know that the times are tough, but you're part of a caring community that's filled with all these people. And again, you show, you saw that list of 30 different people who are dedicated to keeping folks safe. Um, and so we left this on people's doorsteps that we didn't get to uh, chat with necessarily and left a little our little flyers with some candy so some reverse trick-or-treating um, and this was really well received we actually had an um, two older residents stop one of our groups they weren't really interested in in chatting with us per se um, because they wanted to maintain social distance and had some things but they were so excited about the note um, and so I think that that's just something that's been kind of cool to see. Yeah. Uh, it's great with having some visuals and I think um, especially for people who receive that note it's, it's, a, it's a really positive way of connecting. I, I wanted to take a quick pause because there's a couple of questions in the room. Um, so we've got a question here. What are the hours for trick-or-treating on Saturday? So I don't think we have really designated hours for trick-or-treating. There is a um, car parade that the uh, LSSC is sponsoring, I think from three to four. And that's one way that starts at the high school, I believe. And then that's one way to participate. And it's really up to the individuals to um, decide, is there something, is a cat has an answer maybe. It's on our flyer. I was okay. just saying it's on there. If people want, if, you know, it's also on our QR code there, so. And I guess this this is a kind of connects, maybe Captain Ting can give us some context for this. I mean, Amherst, even before COVID, didn't necessarily have established Halloween trick-or-treat times. Is that right? As far That's as the... Right. There's, there's never been a, a designated time per se. Um, in general, uh, in our larger neighborhoods, you know, we've, we've traditionally seen a lot of... Um, people trick or treating in the Amherst Woods and Echo Hill areas. Um, and it's usually during daylight hours. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of times it's young kids with families and whatnot, and uh, usually ends by eight o'clock, nine o'clock at the latest. Uh, so really during the majority of daylight hours is when you'll see most of the trick or treaters. Great, thank you. And that's a question that comes up every year, not just during COVID, I, I know over the years, we've gotten that question, you know, wanting to know what the official time is. So, and just to be clear, you know, while the town has offered some low risk um, options or events through LSSC, and um, we've put out some guidance or tips, our, the safest way um, to celebrate Halloween this year is staying home or participating in those low risk activities. So um, there's a hard hitting question that just came into the room. Name, name your favorite Halloween candy. Well, Can I you, it? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's a no-brainer. I don't think it needs. Everybody knows what the right answer is. So, right, Gabe? candy corn. That's right. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and say Snickers. So, if you guys won't <laughs> commit, I'm a Kit Kat kind of guy. So, I'm a Reese's gal. Reese's. <laughs> okay. Reese's is up there. All chocolate, though. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. Let's see, I know we had some great visuals for some of those events that I'm, I'm happy to put back up. Yeah, Kat shared some photos, but we also have some other questions that have come in. Um, so I'm gonna grab a couple of those. Uh, one of them, and this is open to anybody in the room, what do you think of the university's decision to open up the campus to 7,000 plus additional students? Will that bring added risk to the town? I've done a lot of talking, so I'm just going to be quiet to make space. For folks. That's, that's not me copping out. I'm just recognizing that I've spoken a lot already. 
so yeah the you know we i mentioned this earlier i think that that there is uh any additional people in town brings a certain level of risk with it. Um, you know, I think that it, we don't know where we are. Uh, we know where we are today. We don't know where we're going to be on February 1st. So it's really hard to make a judgment at this moment in time. Um, I think with pro proper protocols, things can be managed well. There's some evidence that having students on campus is one of the safest place for students to be. Um, and so our biggest concern as a town is really the off-campus activity and the sort of migration of students on campus to off campus, which hasn't been that uh, that happening that much this year, be mainly because there aren't that many students on campus. So that's big, our biggest point of concern, I think, is um, off campus. And Gabe, maybe, oops, Gabe, you're leaving. Well, um, <laughs> I will say too, Paul, like when we do door knocks, um, and Gabe's back so he can maybe pop in, yeah. but I will say when we do door knocks with off campus students, I think it's really important. And again, I'm not trying to sort of, you know, spin or promote one narrative over the other. I want to be really clear about that. I'm just saying that this is what we hear and see on the ground um, is that the majority of students, in including those who live off campus, are really wanting to do the right thing, are being safe. You know, when we do these door knocks, everyone is like, yep, I went and got tested. Mm -hmm. And they share some really interesting ways that they're, you know, being safe. Um, you know, things like we have a chalkboard in our house and we have the name, the one name of somebody who is allowed into our house. And that's it because my grandma is immunocompromised and I want to be able to visit my grandma um, and things like that. So I think that that's like a really important piece to hold because I think oftentimes in, you know, times of crisis and a pandemic is that, right? Like it's really easy to be afraid and to to jump to that. And I think it's also really important to, to you know, honor and respect those feelings, but also really balance it with like Paul said, like a lot of proper protocol and procedures in place are, are doing that. And there's a lot of folks that are that are doing that. And it's a, it's a well-oiled machine in, in many ways. So uh, yeah, to add to that, when we were going door knocking, we went to a fraternity and we asked about testing. They said, oh, we go on Tuesdays. It's like, they all knew that's our day. And that was sort of a group activity and they all went together. But I think Gabe, it'd be interesting. Um, I think we've noticed a, very, a pretty strong um, downturn in the number of large gatherings that we've had this this fall, right? You know, it's been interesting, you know, so, you know, just echo your sentiments in, in terms of uh, what the future holds. You know, while I understand the concerns in the future can never fully be predicted. Um, Certainly with the strat strategies that have been implemented from UMass, uh, from the rules and regulations so far uh, on campus and the amount of testing that they've been doing, um, their plan seems to be you know, pretty solid. And I'm pretty optimistic that we're gonna be able to work with it to try and ensure everyone's safety as best as possible. And certainly from what we've seen, what we've learned from the town side in terms of um, large gatherings and whatnot, uh, for the most part, all of the parties off campus um, within the college community have been small. They've been reasonable. And, you know, what has disappeared is the large day drinks and large scale parties that you would normally see on any given weekend um, if COVID wasn't uh, apparent. But certainly it seems like the, the college community has been trying their best. You know, they're college kids and they certainly want to socialize and they do want to gather. And, but for the most part, it's been pretty responsible and the students have been responsive and I feel pretty confident that even with the uh, addition of the students coming in in the spring that that will probably continue. You know, it just seems like the, the, the current culture has changed and it's becoming a lot more accepted and uh, in terms of social distancing and wearing masks and just being responsible. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about it. And can I add one more thing to that? If that's okay. Yep. Um, so uh, you just made me think about it. So again, I think I think this partnership between the town and the university is so interesting and so unique. So while we were out in our group, um, I had one of the folks, Rowan, who works over at UMass at the Mullen Center for testing. And it was really great because we had stopped with some students and we had had a really you know, a good lengthy conversation with them and they had asked some questions. We also had one of the officers in our group. So they'd asked some questions around 
um, sort of how noise violations work and, you know, and gatherings and then and specifically on testing. And we had another group of students that we talked with and they were talking about how to better community relations with their um, with their next door neighbor, because they said, you know, we live in a house with four people. Our neighbor came up and said, you need to social distance because a birthday card was delivered to the wrong house. And they said, how do we reach out to her and sort of you know, smooth that over. We want to make sure she's comfortable. We want her to know, you know, we have a shared bathroom, but we're staying to our pod. We were just out fixing our bicycle sort of. Um, and from that, actually, those students had asked um, their public health students. And so um, they're going to be looking for more folks, um, students over at the testing center. And so we were able to kind of connect them in and, and pass them along to, to Rowan and, um, you know, see about if they can help support that work at UMass. And I think that, again, just shows this really, you know, collaborative nature. And, and through talking with those two young women, they had already been in conversation with Sally Lenowski at the off-campus student center for some other things. So it's, it's really cool to see how seamless this all is. Um, and I think that, the more communication and, and, and transparency in that way, it really helps, you know, create that, that wraparound approach, which I think will help procedures and, and policy be, you know, just better implemented. I agree. I just want to add that, you know, the collaborations that we've been making, you know, certainly with um, our, our partners at the university in trying to, you know, make this, uh, this is an issue that affects all of us here within the community. So it really takes everyone's hand to, uh, participate in order to make sure that this, that there's a successful outcome. Um, you know, ever since the university has allowed uh, first responders to go over to uh, their testing sites and to get tested weekly, I've been doing that every single week. And it amazes me how much, how much compliance there is. Every time I go there, there's lines out the door um, full of students. And, you know, it's just become a normalcy for the student body, which is just wonderful to see. So, uh, so I guess in short, it seems like the, the efforts that we've been making as well as the students in the university collaboratively have, have been working. All right, so I've got another question from the room. Jeff, um, Jeff says he finds the statistics on the online dashboards that the town and UMass maintain to be quite valuable. The town site publishes daily townwide COVID case counts, but does not list historical data. Could this information be added to the dashboard page so that we can get an idea of the trends? That's mostly your question, Brianna. <laughs> you run uh, it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's more of a, a I guess if, if our public health director were here, it's more of um, been a decision on how we present that information coming from that office. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, if, if they decided to want to present the information in that way, we could add it to that, to that okay. space. Um, right now, for those who aren't familiar with that dashboard, we, uh, we update it usually in the afternoon with the current active cases within the town, as well as the cumulative case count, but it doesn't really give you that um, perception of, you know, did we just go down or go up over the last few days, unless you check it religiously, like probably Jeff and me. Um, but that being said, um, we have a new public health director who's coming online if she hasn't already, Paul, is she? Monday, she starts Monday. Monday. Mm -hmm. So I will take that feedback and I will definitely discuss that with her to see if that's something that we can kind of incorporate moving forward. Thank you, Jeff. All right. So we have six minutes left. Time flies when you're having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to give a last chance for the folks in the room if they wanted to pop in another question, comment. Um, now is the time. Otherwise, I have a couple other questions that were submitted um, previously. And I think I think it's important, this one, because of the our special guests here, um, I've gotten this question a couple of times. How does the ambassador program and Amherst police connect or how do they work together? Is it something that's in Amherst police? Is it a townwide um, initiative? So if um, either of you could speak to that, that'd be great. Yeah. Gabe, do you want to chat or you want me to chat? Again, I just feel like I've been talking a lot, so I want to make space. Well, that's okay. You know, I, uh, I'll just say, you know, from the, I'll just, I'll throw something out there and you can uh, add to it, Kat. Sounds you know, the, the ambassador program is, um, it's an issue. It's there aren't too many of them out there, you know. And it, you know, I know there's one in Worcester and there's some out uh, out west in California. But um, for this area, this is kind of a, a new way of doing things, um, and it's been highly successful. I'm going to let Kat talk about that. But in terms of the collaboration between uh, us and the ambassadors, you know, we we don't run the ambassador program, the police department. 
we're there as a resource and to support the ambassador program. So we kind of see ourselves as a partnership. You know, certainly the ambassadors uh, uh, utilize, you know, what we have to offer to kind of augment their mission because ultimately their mission is the same mission as ours. You know, we're trying to solve these problems and to try and find successful resolutions. So um, I would characterize that mostly as, as a partnership. You know, we're just, we're there to help each other out. And yeah. with that, if you want to add to that. No, I think that's a great way of, of um, framing it, Gabe. Thank you. And I think, um, you know, it's we're we're a town program and we're housed um, within the within the police station. And I think that makes a lot of sense in many ways because we partner really heavily, um, as Gabe was saying, and, you know, Officer Laramie has been really helpful. He's the community neighborhood liaison officer. And that also has dovetailed a lot of the work that I've done at the off-campus student center when I run the Walk This Way program. So a lot of that is, again, just sort of building on really effective and, and sort of this seamless collaboration. Um, plus we get to hang out with Winston, which is pretty great. Um, but you know, we, we partner in that way. And I think a good example, um, Brianna, to this question of showing sort of um, other roles, um, you know, our role is is responding to COVID right now, right, and sort of helping create a, a positive, you know, sort of entry point in in COVID. So mask, you know, in education and things like that. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing, and a big shout out to um, the town clerk Sue Adet, who came in yesterday along with Captain uh, with Gabe and um, and our staff meeting, and uh, we're going to actually be deploying some of our um, our ambassadors to be at polling locations for election day. Um, and they're going to basically be there um, and the main role of them, you know, because they're a town employee, they're not trained to be poll workers. So they're they're sort of as a as a neutral presence and they're um, handing out masks if anybody has shown up to the poll and, and forgot theirs or if they're, you know, if it's laundry day and they, they forgot it. Um, so they're going to do that. Um, there's also going to be touchless hand sanitizers that are um, at all of the polling uh, sites that Sue had been talking to us about and that's new this year um, and so it was something that they thought people might actually just walk right by so our ambassadors are there to kind of remind folks to to do that um, so that's kind of an example because again one of our things right is for um, for poll for voting and things which we we want folks to do in our community uh, one of the barriers with COVID was that people might not feel safe for in-person voting so the role of the ambassadors then is to you know go and sort of help how do we mitigate, how do we lessen that barrier? And that's one of the things we're doing. And again, we're doing that in conjunction with multiple town offices, um, you know, and there's many of the officers and the constables will be there. So again, it'll be part of that partnership, um, but we're not directly, you know, we're not directly through the police department. And I think that that's actually a really important piece. And Gabe kind of spoke to this around, um, there's not a lot of programs like this in the country right now. And I think it's a really cool way to show, um, how you can partner with police and not make everything fall onto police, right? It's a really good reallocation of, of those resources and those roles. Yeah, I just wanna jump on that a little bit. Um, so the elections thing is really important for us because we anticipate there'll be lines. We, we've done really well. We're at 49.4% of the registered voters have voted already. Um, we'd like to get that up. Um, typically in a presidential election year, year we're in the 68 to 69% of registered voters. Um, we do anticipate because of social distancing, the lines will seem long because we're asking people to be six feet apart. And there's it's, called, it's a thing called line comfort is educating people saying, hey, it'll, it's, it's let's go about five minutes from here, helping, you know, if people have a hard time parking, if there's someone who needs support, it's just so they're, they're not election workers, but just sort of folks to help augment the, the current force that we have out there. Um, and also, I think what's really important is, is just what Kat mentioned, is that the philosophy of this is to create a culture of compliance and not enforcement. Because we, public health researchers know that voluntary compliance is much more effective than um, punitive measures. And so we, we don't want to lose the sense of enforcement but, but we really want to lead with, um, with the positive notion. And I think that's been very successful for us and especially with, the, um, with our community. So thanks for, and I just have to say, you know, Kat was able to stand up this program in like record time with enormous, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of people employed and out on the streets doing the work within days, it seemed. It might've been a week, but boy, it happened fast. I am Thank as good you. as my team. I feel really happy and so privileged to be brought on to, to really good, you know, collaboration. So thank you, Paul, for that. Mm -hmm.
All right. I know 30 minutes went by really quick. It's, it's 1230. I do want to give a chance. Um, if there's anything else we want to leave pe folks with um, that you didn't get a chance to say, um, feel free to do that now. Just be safe on Halloween. Make, make wise choices. Yes. Um, so we will be back next week at noon with new special guests. This recording will be up on our YouTube channel. And if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to subscribe to our channel right now. Okay. Thank you all. Have a Thanks, great Brianna. day. Thanks, Thanks, Happy Halloween. Have a beautiful day. <laughs> Funny.